welcome everyone here today. My name is Carol Hills, and I'm senior producer and reporter for PRI's The World. I also, um, I'm with you here today. I've done these a few times, and they're always incredibly interesting. Uh, I want you to know this event is, is in collaboration with PRI's The World and WGBH, and both the forum and PRI's initiative called Across Women's Lives are streaming the event live on their websites and on Facebook. Our program is an hour long, and it's part of the Dr. Lawrence H. and Roberta Cohn forums. Uh, last January, Dr. Cohn, a renowned cardiac surgeon, he passed away unexpectedly. He's very much missed by his colleagues, his friends, and his family. Uh, but we are very pleased to have his daughter, Leslie Cohn Bernstein, with us today. She is Dr. and Mrs. Cohn's daughter, and we also send our greetings to Mrs. Cohn. She couldn't make it, but I want to thank you and your family for making this possible. I want to introduce our panelists. To my right are Claire Misko. She is the Chief Executive Officer of the National Eating Disorders Association. Next is Allison Field. She is the Chief of the Department of Epidemiology at Brown University. Bryn Austin is Professor in the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences here at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. She's also Director of an uh, initiative called STRIPED. Um, it's an acronym which means a strategic training initiative for the prevention of eating disorders. And Thomas Weigel is a psychiatrist and associate medical director at the Klarman Eating Disorder Center at McLean Hospital. Now, um, eating disorders, it's, it's, a, it's a huge issue. Uh, it's underappreciated, but it's getting more and more attention. Uh, at the national level as well. Both Claire and Bryn were, uh, last week were at the White House for a national roundtable discussion on eating disorders. And the American Academy of Pediatrics just published a report last month on preventing obesity and eating disorders in adolescents. Um, this program will include a brief Q&A at the end. I encourage you to ask questions. You can also email questions to the forum at hsph.harvard.edu. And you can also participate in a live chat. It's happening right now on the forum site. Um, I want to start with a figure, and that figure is 30 million, uh, an estimated 30 million Americans have eating disorders, and experts assume that there are many more that are simply undiagnosed. Um, these illnesses, they take different forms, and they, contrary to, I think, a lot, what a lot of people imagine is someone with an eating disorder, it affects people of all ages, all types, all backgrounds. It's a very diverse group, and I think one of the goals here is to get away from what we may, the kind of people we may think have eating disorders uh, while not thinking of other people. Um, this, we strategically scheduled this forum between New York and Milan and Paris Fashion Weeks, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> which gives us a great opportunity to look at the misperceptions about eating disorders. Uh, explore the kind of treatment that's going on, and consider the impact of much larger forces like advertising and media messages on things like body image. I'm going to turn to Claire first. Um, you had an organization that educates the public about eating disorders. If you could give us a sense of the scope of this issue. Sure. Well, first of all, thank you, Carol. And I'm just, I'm really thrilled to have this opportunity here um, today to talk about eating disorders. Um, these are serious public health issues, and they are woefully misunderstood, underfunded, and um, often untreated. In fact, most people who struggle with eating disorders don't get treatment. So it's really important that, that we're here today to talk about this. Um, you noted that 30 million Americans struggle with eating disorders. Um, we're talking about diagnosable eating disorders. So when we talk about eating disorders, we're talking about a range of behaviors. Um, there's anorexia, which is characterized by restriction, um, and typically what we think of as self-starvation. Um, bulimia is an eating disorder that's characterized by binging, that's eating large quantities of food in one sitting, um, followed by feelings of tremendous shame and guilt, um, and then compensatory behaviors like pur purging like through vomiting or laxative abuse and sometimes um, extreme overexercise. And then there's also binge eating disorder, which, which is actually the most common eating disorder. And binge eating disorder is um, characterized by binging, like we discussed with bulimia, but does not have the compensatory behavior associated with it. 
Um, so those are the, the main diagnosable eating disorders. But as you mentioned, there's also a huge number of people um, who might not fit the diagnostic criteria for any one of these eating disorders, but whose thoughts and behaviors around food, weight, and body image are incredibly disruptive in their lives. Um, and in fact, that's one of the most common issues that we hear about through our helpline. Um, the National Eating Disorders Association gets calls and um, inquiries every day from people who are looking for help. And one of the most common um, inquiries that we get is from people who aren't sure where they fit. You know, I don't know if this counts as an eating disorder. I don't look that sick. Um, I don't know, you know, where I fit in this picture. So there are so many misconceptions and there's a very, very narrow picture that's painted in our culture about who gets eating disorders and what eating disorders look like that really doesn't match up with the reality. Um, in terms of the causes and roots of eating disorders, well, it's very complicated. We say in the field, these are biopsychosocial illnesses. There's a lot of compelling evidence to show that people might be biologically predisposed um, to, to developing eating disorders. There's also a connection with depression, with self-harm, with OCD. Um, so there are a lot of very complex issues at play here. Um, and as you pointed out, we really can't discount the culture either. Um, while it's not like we look at a picture of a thin model and then suddenly spiral into an eating disorder, we get constant messages in our culture. And you know now even more um, with the onslaught of social media and the onslaught of images and messages, um, that thinness and perfection is the answer. Um, it's the key to happiness, success, to fulfillment. And so you know when you have these other vulnerabilities at play, um, those kinds of messages and images are toxic. Um, and you know we have to look at how we're educating kids about health. You know, there's a lot of talk about health, um, particularly related to the obesity epidemic, and you mentioned the AAP study, and we'll get into that more. Um, but, you know, kids are being taught to fear weight gain, to fear fat, to, you know, be ashamed of their body. So we really, really need to think about how we're educating about health in this culture and how that is impacting um, the development of eating disorders. And, you know, I know we're going to be looking at a video that sort of illustrates this um, very clearly and the influence of these messages on very young children. Uh, on that note, you just mentioned um, how young people are incredibly vulnerable. And um, I want to, we're going to roll a little video right now and we're going to look at a public service announcement from the National um, Eating Disorders Association that, that demonstrates just how powerful these messages are and how young, how, how, how they start targeting extremely young people. Am I pretty enough to be noticed? Will they love me if I go on a diet? Why do girls need to be skinny? Do my freckles go away? Do I need lead post section? Do I need a boob job? Do you think I'm fat? Do you think I'm fat? Do you think I'm do you think I'm do you think I'm fat? I want to turn to Allison Field now. Um, you're an investigator in in a, a study. It's called the Growing Up Today study. Um, tell us about that study and what the research is telling you about the pressures children and adolescents face. Absolutely. So we enrolled about seventeen thousand young people, they were 9 to 14 in 1996, and we've been following them ever since. And we looked at both boys and girls, and that's important because boys tend to be overlooked with the assumption that they do not have eating disorders, and that's really not the case. Many girls, as we've heard, want to be thin, and that is the pressure to be thin. Males may want to have very low body fat, not necessarily to be thin. We find for the girls who want to be thin, who may resort to purging, that the more frequently they report uh, looking at the media and wanting to look like those people, the more likely they are to start vomiting to control their weight. And boys, the more they want to have low body fat and really look like these very sculpted physiques you see, they too are very influenced by the media, which is important to remember that it's, it's not just for females. I'm going to turn to Bryn, and um, you, you directed a training initiative specifically to help prevent eating disorders. Uh, what, is, what are you doing and, and what are you hoping to achieve? 
Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, the, I direct the Strategic Training Initiative for the Prevention of Eating Disorders, or STRIPED, as you mentioned in the introduction. Uh, we're a public health incubator, and the reason we formed this training program is because we saw a real um, a lack of attention to and lack of recognition of how serious eating disorders are in the public health field and in the medical field and beyond in healthcare in general. Uh, and we know that this uh, this starts with a lack of training in our public health schools. So we now have the it's the first, and hopefully it'll be one of many training programs in eating disorders prevention at a public health school. We know that uh, uh, only around five percent of medical residency programs include any structured training around eating disorders. It's very rare in public health schools. We know recently the the Centers for Disease Control stopped monitoring eating disorder symptoms in American high school students after 2013. They've stopped monitoring, and we think that this is because of a, a a, a really a lack of understanding of just how serious and critical eating disorders are. They have the highest mortality rate of any psychiatric disorder in the U.S. Uh, a teen with anorexia nervosa has 10 times the risk of dying of, as her peers. This is a very serious issue that we're trying to help get some better training at public health schools. And, and with Striped in particular, we're concerned about the, the consumer industries. And as both Claire and Allison mentioned, the importance of media in creating a, a really toxic environment, as Claire said, for young people growing up. The consumer industries in particular, we're concerned about the fashion industry, mass media, and the dieting industry. These industries set extremely unrealistic standards of thinness or uh, low body fat in the case of males, and they also normalize taking on extreme and sometimes downright dangerous methods to change weight and shape. And so with our work at Striped, we've really tried to tackle these industries um, and see what we can do bringing a public health perspective to prevention to address these problems. Tom, um, you are you run an eating disorders treatment program at McLean. Give us a medical perspective on uh, the diagnosis and treatment of eating disorders. Um, I think people always describe eating disorders as very complex, and if you could kind of illuminate what that means. Sure. Um, we have a 20-bed residential treatment unit uh, out in Belmont, Massachusetts, and we see people from uh, the New England area, but also around the country and around the world um, who, who come in for treatment. And as the other you know, panelists had noted, eating disorders are extremely common and often go untreated or undertreated. And uh, people with anorexia have, in particular, have a much higher death rate than the general population. Uh, it's actually about a half a percent a year for each year that you have the disorder. Um, as mentioned, there's some biological, psychological, and social aspects of developing an eating disorder. There's definitely a genetic component to eating disorders, and as well from a psychological perspective, uh, things like a negative body image and low se self-esteem can be impactful. Uh, also from an environmental standpoint, uh, social stresses and uh, family conflict, uh, as well as uh, childhood trauma and sexual abuse are uh, etiologically etiologic factors that we, we often see. Uh, there's a lot of medical complications from eating disorders. There's, uh, with a lot of other mental health disorders like anxiety and depression, you don't see a lot of medical complications. But for eating disorders, we might see minor things like uh, hair loss or constipation, which I don't think any of us want. But then more significantly, uh, eating disorders can actually shrink your heart. When, when you're malnourished, your body eats itself for food. It's kind of gross, but it happens, and it eats your heart muscle and other parts of your body. So your heart actually shrinks. Your heart becomes weaker. Uh, this can result in a slow heart rate, low blood pressure, dizziness, uh, and um, low energy. Uh, you can also have electrolyte abnormalities, changes in your sodium and potassium. Your body's really reliant on this for things like how your heart conducts so people can have sudden death if their electrolytes are not uh, properly balanced. And, and eating disorders really adversely impact bone health. Uh, people can stop growing if they're malnourished and also uh, develop osteoporosis at an early age. I have quite a number of uh, young patients in their 20s who have severe osteoporosis and, and multiple uh, bone fractures from that. There's also medical complications from treatment of eating disorders. So when people start to eat more consistently and stop using their behaviors as much, um, people can have uh, pancreatitis symptoms and also develop something called refeeding syndrome where they start to retain fluids and can actually go into heart failure and die. Um, so those are important medical things to consider when, when treating eating disorders. Um, as far as 
therapy, it, it is pretty complicated. Uh, yeah, I think as was mentioned with addictions, with a, a cocaine problem, you can stop using cocaine and avoid places where you might encounter it. That's oversimplified. There's a lot more involved in treatment. Um, but with food, you, you can't avoid it. it. It's there all the time. You need to eat it many times a day. So we really focus on consistent normalized eating and trying to reduce the frequency and severity of these eating disorder behaviors with various individual therapy techniques, psychodynamic, cognitive, behavioral, and dialectical behavioral therapies. We also do a lot of family therapy. At the very least, uh, families need education about eating disorders. They're, they're tough to understand. And we also focus on uh, family struggles or conflicts that might perpetuate an eating disorder. Um, and then uh, there's a lot of what we call comorbidities with eating disorders. Um, people who have eating disorders often suffer from depression, anxiety, addiction, uh, trauma, post-traumatic stress disorder, and borderline personality disorder. Uh, and so um, as their eating disorder behaviors get better, oftentimes we see other things get worse, their mood, their anxiety, uh, substance abuse, self-harm, cutting, those things may also all get worse as their eating disorders actually getting better. Um, before we go to the second part, I wanted to come back to Allison for uh, just a minute. Um, and I, I wondered if you could just touch on the fact that um, eating disorders, it's, 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 they're actual illnesses. It's not, there's no supposition and, and it's, it's documented and there's DSM criteria for it. Uh, and also the degree to which uh, this is a, a problem that exists in other countries. It, the problem does exist in other countries, but it's important to remember that we don't capture all eating disorders. So as Claire was mentioning, binge eating is more common than anorexia and bulimia combined. And if you can bring up the first slide that I have, you can see that anorexia and bulimia are, are quite uncommon, thankfully. You can, those are the two lowest bars. In dark blue is binge eating disorder. That is more common than anorexia and bulimia combined. There are just as many young women who are just purging, if you will. They do not engage in binge eating. And up to 20% of young adults are engaging in these at low levels. And so that, I mean monthly, but what we find in the Growing Up Today study is young women who engage in these behaviors even monthly they have the same risks which are elevated for starting to binge drink frequently, starting to use drugs, becoming depressed. These are really serious illnesses. And the binge eating disorder is a recent addition to the DSM. And it had a really a tough fight to be recognized. Many people did not believe that it existed. Many patients may not consider it an eating disorder. They may consider it a weight disorder in adults. Binge eating disorder is very common in overweight populations. But these are patients who may not be coming to a psychiatrist. They may be going to a weight loss center. With adolescents, many of these patients may still be normal weight. Um, this is the same for purging disorder, so these patients may be completely missed. We're going to switch to um, looking at kind of uh, what the latest research and information is telling us about um, uh, the right way to approach these issues through public health means or, or treatment. Um, I want to start with, um, we're going to actually set up another, another clip, uh, and this is relevant because it's um, Countries are, are actually passing legislation to try to address eating disorders. And um, last year, France passed a law requiring that models be above a certain body mass index, or BMI. And so we, we're going to take a, a look at a short clip from our colleagues at Reuters that explains more about that law. These days, you can be too skinny in Paris. France is now banning excessively thin fashion models. Violators will be fined up to 75,000 euros, or more than $81,000, and could even face jail time. The law will enforce regular weight checks. Models will be required to present a medical certificate, showing that their body mass index complies with regulations before being allowed to work. France now joins Italy, Spain, and Israel which all adopted laws against super thin models in early 2013. I want to turn to Bryn. Uh, we're in the more informal part of this, this forum, um, so we'll just kind of be chatting across the panel. But I want to start with Bryn. Um, what do you think of this kind of legislation? Oh, it's so needed, absolutely needed. And there's global momentum here now, as in the examples from the, from the Reuters piece we just saw with France being the latest nation to 
make a move uh, really on the federal level to protect models and in, and the, in a larger scheme to protect society and especially girls and young women from these images. Now we've seen some of this kind of uh, momentum here in the United States. Uh, last uh, December, a colleague, um, Catherine Record, and I published a, a health law critique in the American Journal of Public Health calling for the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, part of the U.S. government, to step in and start regulating this industry to protect the health and safety of models with the expectation, one, will protect models, and two, it'll have a ripple effect on the images depicted that, that Claire and Allison talked about. Assemblymember Mark Levine in the California State Assembly picked that up, to pick that work up, and, and proposed new legislation in California to protect the health and safety, and particularly with a focus on the eating disorders risk among models working in California. We worked on that together with our community partners, the National Eating Disorders Association, Claire's organization, and the Model Alliance, which is a really unique uh, uh, labor organizing group in the U.S., uh, led by Sarah Ziff, founded by Sarah Ziff, um, to uh, improve these issues in, in the fashion industry. What we want to see is the protection of models absolutely as workers. I mean, what other industry do we have in the U.S. where children, which uh, the, the uh, vast majority of models are women and girls, and many of those are minors, children, they are being pressured to essentially starve themselves to keep a job. What other industry do we have in the U.S. where this is allowed to go on? Um, I can't think of one. Um, so it's, it's absolutely one where we need to intervene, and we've got momentum here in the U.S., and absolutely we're following the lead of other countries. Is the effort also to just create a, a different idea of what a model should look like? Is it not only to protect models and workers, but is it also to try to re-envision what, you know, that models should have all sorts of different bodies. Is that part of the goal, to sort of change what we think of? Yeah, absolutely. We want to see more diversity in the images. Um, whether we achieve that through legislation or we see, achieve it through corporate social responsibility, which I think Claire's going to hit on also, the importance of that work, we see a growing niche marketing of uh, a much more diverse uh, size, sizing in clothing, and that's something that we would support. Um, and absolutely, we want to see a real sea change in what these images are that are put out there. We don't need to see any more of these images that are setting unrealistic standards of thinness uh, for every 10-year-old uh, girl and boy to see as, as uh, set up as the ideal of uh, body image for them. And I think we are actually um, at, a, at a very important moment in advertising. We are starting to see um, more of a move towards body positivity and body di diversity in advertising, um, which we're certainly um, at the National Eating Disorders Association and, and all of the advocates who are um, really working to promote this kind of change are really happy about. Um, what are some examples of that? Well, the National Eating Disorders Association actually has a, a great partnership with Aerie, um, which is a brand of American Eagle Outfitters. Um, they launched a campaign uh, in 2014 called Aerie Real, um, which is all about um, promoting body diversity. They don't retouch their models. And this was a really um, kind of grassroots response from our community to this ad campaign. Um, we posted, um, a there was a blog post on our website and our community, particularly of young people, responded so positively to this because one of the most common things we hear from people is, I don't see myself reflected in the media I consume. And you know, if you are at risk for developing an eating disorder, um, or if you're in the process of trying to recover from an eating disorder, um, this very narrow um, picture of what the you know what beauty and the perfect body looks like is is very damaging. So you know, it's it's a really important thing to be able to see body diversity in in advertising. What about the challenge of just uh, digitally altered photos? You know, airbrushing. You know, magazines online. I mean. In most images you see of in advertising or modeling, they're, you know, they've been retouched. Uh, is is there any sense that that should be, uh, that should be divulged, or there should be any kind of regulation? About Absolutely, it? it's a huge problem. So you have young people who are holding these up as their ideals, and even the model doesn't look like the picture. Mm -hmm. So the model's not perfect enough. So with young men, you'll see all the, you know, this making of perfect six-pack abs, and they'll shave off for the women, make their waist smaller. And it's a huge problem because but is there anything pending to really force that issue, or is it at the discussion level? Oh, I think Claire is going to follow up on some of her work. Yeah, well, there is, um, there is federal legislation um, that is asking for the FTC to study um, the effectiveness of putting labels on, on advertisements that have been retouched. 
Um, so we want to understand if this is an effective strategy, um, and that is something that, that we're really interested in learning more about um, at the public health and legislative level. Does it exist in any other country? Uh, it does. I believe Israel has. Yeah, Israel, um, the, the new French law um, the, in um, London, the, the mayor of London has pushed some of this forward. We are in a tricky situation in the U.S. because we have such strong uh, freedom of expression. The First Amendment of the Constitution is very different in the U.S. than other countries. And, and actually with Striped, we have a legal research team working on uh, what is the value of, of laws passed in other countries and how much of those actually can be uh, carried out in the U.S. or what different models? And I think that what is what brings us back to the corporate social responsibility angle that Claire was talking about with NIDA is we can't, as much as we need better regulation and better legislation, we can't legislate ourselves out of this problem. We need corporations to step up and take more responsibility for their marketing, for their photoshopping, and for the other, the diet industry. We need them to step up and be part of the solution. And you know, in fact, that that is what's what's really encouraging about this is that we're seeing that not only does it have a feel-good effect, but it actually is throwing this whole idea that you know you need to make people feel bad about themselves in order for them to spend money and be mm -hmm. connected to your brand. That's out the window because mm -hmm. you know Aerie, as one example, has seen incredible um, profit growth from from this strategy, and their consumers are really responding positively to this. So you know this old idea that you know insecurity sells really um, has to be thrown out. And Bryn, I just want you to uh, just briefly mention the legislation that Massachusetts was considering. Yeah, around diet pills, right? Uh, yes, yeah, so another area that we're very concerned with is the sale of diet pills and dietary supplements for weight loss and muscle building to anyone, but especially to minors. And so we teamed up with our colleagues here, the Multi-Service Eating Disorders Association led by Beth Mayer and Representative Kay Khan in the Massachusetts State House. And Kay Khan sponsored a bill in the last legislative, legislative session to ban the sale of these products. They are dangerous, they're deceptive. Minors should not be using them, children should not be using them. To ban the sale in Massachusetts and move them behind the counter. Uh, the bill, as most first bills, don't, didn't make it through the whole process, but we are uh, all working together to get the bill reintroduced in planning to expand this work. Uh, also working with NIDA, as always, on any good advocacy effort has to involve NIDA because they're the, the experts at that. Um, we're going to be moving this forward and we want to see it moving forward across the country. Tom, uh, talk to us about uh, mental health parity and uh, insurance coverage and the kinds of things that are available to people suffering from eating disorders. Sure. The, you know, the, uh, the federal government has the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act, which really says that you uh, insurance companies have to treat mental health uh, diagnoses and disorders just like they would a medical disorder like uh, diabetes, heart disease, or cancer. So you can't limit treatments for mental health or, or require special hoops for people to jump through for that treatment if you don't do the same for your medical diagnoses, uh, which is which is great and it's really increased the coverage for uh, all of mental health, but in particular eating disorders. Um, but the, the law does have quite a number of loopholes and uh, one is certainly that there's exceptions to this law for smaller companies and for some privately insured plans um, that they just don't have to have parity. Uh, which seems kind of ridiculous. Also, oftentimes there's just coverage from these insurance companies for the diagnoses of anorexia and bulimia. And at least on our treatment unit, uh, at least a third of the patients uh, don't meet criteria for those diagnoses, even though they have such severe eating disorder behaviors that they're medically compromised and need 24-7 care and treatment. Uh, there's also uh, a lack of standardization of medical necessity criteria. So insurance companies use these criteria to determine whether they're going to pay for a certain level of care or treatment for patients. And uh, for some insurance plans, you have to really be on death's door to get coverage or treatment for eating disorders. Can you sneak it in under some other coverage? Uh, no. I, 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 it's really maddening. I, I'll be on the phone with a uh, physician at an insurance company and really describing all the different struggles and behaviors and uh, difficulties that a patient's struggling with in, in laboratory abnormalities and other things, and the coverage will just get denied. It's, it's really frustrating. You know, if I could just add, right now on the U.S. 
Senate, in the U.S. Senate, there's a bill, mental health reform bill, that writes in uh, corrections to these flaws in the mental health parity, addressing the eating disorders gaps in coverage. It is uh, supposed to be voted on this month in the U.S. Senate. The Eating Disorders Coalition, NIDA, and other partners have been pushing this through. As long as the senators take it up, we are in a good place to be able to address these exact issues you're talking about through U.S. Congress if they act this month. Yeah. Yeah. And this is one of the most common um, issues that we hear about through our helpline also. We hear from parents um, who are desperate to get help for their children and have been turned down by their insurance companies, um, have mortgaged homes to pay for treatment. I mean, this is a really, really serious and common issue. Is the That's partially with the diagnostic criteria. So unlike hypertension, where we look at the continuum and you would start treating someone maybe with you know, behavior, so changing their diet, trying to lower blood pressure as it gets more serious, you might give meds. The bar is so high for eating disorders, which is a huge problem because it, it's one reason that people may not get the coverage. That's right. Um, I wanted to ask whether the issue with getting treatment for eating disorders is that is it the lack of coverage or a lack of treatment programs or both? Like if, if you had the coverage, if that was available, is, are there enough programs for people? Or is it like uh, you know, the opioid crisis where there's not nearly enough treatment available? It's even recognition. So even in countries with socialized medicine, the majority of people with an eating disorder don't get treatment. So there are many things, and we don't but know I mean, all of them. Is there treatment available? And well, is it a, or we don't, or well, we're we can't in Boston, access it? So we're going to be in much better shape yeah. than you're in rural Kansas. And even here, yeah. you can speak to sure, your I think, beds. I think that there, is, that there are not enough providers who have experience with eating disorders. And since this is the tough dis these are tough disorders to understand, they're, they're even more difficult to treat. Uh, and, and so uh, I think trying to get more training into the residency programs and uh, you know, psychology and social work schools and public health schools is very important. Uh, there are quite a number of treatment centers. Some of them don't take insur insurance, unfortunately. Um, but uh, I, I think it really is recognition of, of the different symptoms and behaviors that's, that's running behind everything else right now. I want to move to the school setting. I mean, over the years, uh, issues around obesity have been brought to the school level and, and you know, measuring BMI, and it's, it's kind of part of the public health message schools are paying attention. Uh, to what degree have eating disorders been taken on at the public school level in the U.S.? Or, and well, what's think, working or not? Uh, yeah. yeah, I think it's a, um, unfortunately, schools haven't been screening um, for eating disorders, and there's been so much focus on the obes obesity epidemic, and a lot of uh, very well-intentioned obesity prevention programs. Um, what we're hearing from our constituents is they're actually backfiring because of the intense focus on weight and the numbers on the scale. So we hear um, from people who cite these w school weigh-ins or BMI report cards um, as the start of their obsession. Now, not to say that it caused it, but that it was certainly a factor. So we really, again, need to think about how we're educating kids holistically um, and, and pushing for a more holistic approach to health and taking the focus away um, from weight and the number on the scale. And in fact, um, this recent American Academy of Pediatrics report um, says just that. Um, it, it talks about uh, factors for both obesity and eating disorders prevention. And one of the key recommendations is to shift away um, from shaming kids about weight and focus on weight. It's much more about talking about health, what makes your body feel good, um, what exercise gives you strength. Um, it's much of a, it's a very, very different approach from um, this shame-based uh, approach, which really, really reinforces weight stigma, um, which we know actually um, does not have any health benefits whatsoever. So what would that look like in, in, in a school setting? Would it be that, that kids all, all kids cycle through and are asked a series of questions as a way to uh, assess whether there's an eating disorder issue, or would a, a, a student be asked in response to something? Well, you know, How would it work? Uh, you know, the good news to follow up on this is that there actually are uh, several evidence-based effective programs for middle schools, for high schools, for university settings to prevent eating disorders, and some of them actually have a dual preventive effect with obesity. One of them developed here at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. We also know that screening in schools, from economic research, we know that screening in schools is very likely to be as cost effective as, as other kinds of routine screening done with 
adolescents, health screenings. So health programs, as Claire is describing, health programs that can promote positive body image, positive relationships with food and activity, without the shame, without the weight stigma, are the ones where we've seen uh, the best effects, the, the most uh, beneficial effects for young people. And, and where the are they in place, here in Massachusetts or other places? Oh, well, Claire's leading a program in New York, actually, that's very exciting in terms of dissemination progress. Yeah, so we, we're working to disseminate a program called The Body Project, which has um, several decades of, of great research backing it. Um, it shows, uh, to, it, it's been shown to be effective in um, reducing eating disorder symptoms, increasing body satisfaction. Um, and this is a train the trainer model, so our, I, our ideal is to really get a lot of um, schools and people on the ground um, trained in this program so that we can scale it up and get it out into um, communities all across the country. Um, and again, it does have really, really solid evidence. And that's what we're looking for, evidence-based programs. And there are programs out there. Um, we're also very interested in screenings. You know, there are some really solid, simple screenings um, for for educators um, to use in a school-based setting. Um, if we're screening kids for other things, um, we should certainly be screening for eating disorders. And um, that's another big focus for NIDA. And in fact, we were able to um, introduce federal legislation that would establish a pilot program for screenings in middle schools across the country. So this is another Im really important public health uh, focus for us. I wanted to ask um, Tom, um, are eating disorders uh, what is the kind of you know cure rate, or is it like alcoholism that you manage it across a lifetime? What's the range of of, of treatment results? Really? Sure, um, you know the results for uh, bulimia are a little bit better than the results for anorexia. And if you look at the outcome studies, uh, particularly around anorexia, the the results really vary, and, and you can't give a really good solid number. There, there's a percent of people who really get past an eating disorder and, and don't have those residual symptoms. Uh, there's some people who have some chronic low-level symptoms uh, and, and they, they live with that or maybe they work on that in, in ongoing therapy. And then there's, there's a subset that just has uh, ongoing eating disorder symptoms uh, that really are impactful and, and life-limiting. And I guess to, to any of you, um, uh, my final question is, um, through all your research, um, how wide and varied are these uh, types of, of illnesses that people deal with and, and how much of a challenge is that in terms of crafting a public health message or crafting treatment? I think they're completely varied and I think the problem is we've been very gender biased in defining them by the female patients who showed up for treatment. So we know the minority of people seek treatment and we know that's particularly true for males. I think we're missing a lot of males because we're, we're not assuming that there might be a different presentation. We don't know how well it fits in different um, ethnic groups. It may be very different, but it simply hasn't been studied adequately. So I think we miss many, many people. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I agree, Allison. And, and, and as she's saying, that the um, real opportunity for public health messaging is around busting the stereotypes yeah. with both, that both of you brought up. Um, eating disorders absolutely affect people in, of all weight ranges and, and people of higher weight bodies and all the whole range. People of color, communities of color, males, eating disorders affect everyone. Uh, but I think another issue we need to make sure to touch on uh, today is the issue of weight stigma. And that underlies uh, all the work that public health is doing around obesity and obesity prevention and our concerns in eating disorders. Uh, the, uh, our society is rife with weight stigma and weight discrimination. There are not protections for people living in higher weight bodies against employment discrimination, against discrimination in college admissions, and many other settings. Um, the experiences of uh, harassment, teasing, or even what's meant to be friendly guidance, but is not at all friendly. Um, this is a daily occurrence for people living in higher weight bodies. And that is a public health issue. It's a social justice and health equity issue. And that absolutely, being able to address that with our public health messaging will help our efforts to address the obesity epidemic and eating disorders. That's absolutely true. It's an incredibly important issue for obesity as, as, as well as eating disorders. It's not the fear that if you get rid of this shaming, you're going to worsen obesity. In fact, you do the opposite. Mm -hmm. We have about 10 minutes left, and we're going to take questions from our online audience and you here in the studio. I'm going to start with Lisa. She has a question from our online audience. 
Thanks, Carol. We have a lot of questions coming in, so I just encourage everyone to go on our chat as well, which is going on now. It will be posted online afterwards, and you can see the questions. And we have many coming in from other countries, too. Here's one from David Ross, Medical Officer, Adolescent Health at WHO headquarters in Geneva. Should there be a target discharge BMI for all anorexics admitted to hospital? If so, what should it be and why? Sure. Uh, very focused question. And <laughs> yeah, they do. They're all different sorts coming in. So <laughs> You know, I, on our treatment unit, we, we uh, think more in percent ideal body weight, which you can convert to BMI. But, um, you know, the research on our treatment unit itself is that we, we on average get patients with anorexia from um, around the, the 70 percentile range of, uh, of BMI up to about 92 percent, or of uh, ideal body weight up to about 92 percent. Uh, and I think there's a study that suggests that if you get somebody to around 92, 93 percent ideal body weight, that they're much less likely to have to come back for treatment. Um, as somebody's gaining weight with anorexia, you have to constantly increase the meal plans. They're eating more and more food. So if we're inching somebody toward a healthy weight range uh, and, and they're five pounds short of that, they might be on 4,500, 5,000 calories a day just to get their weight to move forward. And for us to discharge them from our residential treatment program, somebody with such fears of weight gain on such a massive meal plan, it's, it's just unconscionable. They're not going to follow that when they leave. So we try to get patients to a healthy weight range in our program and then on what we call a maintenance meal plan uh, and, and to have them take passes on that maintenance meal plan uh, and to make sure that they're choosing the right foods and not using behaviors. And once they're able to do all of that, that's when we try to step them down from residential treatment to maybe a day program or partial hospital program. Thank you, that's very helpful. Thank you. Uh, this is from Louise. Do children from wealthier socioeconomic backgrounds tend to have ED more than children from, quote, disadvantaged, unquote, socioeconomic backgrounds, and if so, why? No, those, that is one of the popular misconceptions. I think we used to think that, and that, those were the children, I think, who were more likely to get treated, mm -hmm. so they would be brought in for treatment. It's gotten slightly better with parity that there's now more coverage. The population-based studies actually find that eating disordered behaviors are more common, um, particularly because they vary with weight in lower SES populations. We find very high rates in Hispanic populations, not just Caucasian populations. And they really, as, as Brenda said, we see them everywhere. Thank you. That, that is a misconception, I think, so thank you. Carol, if I can take one more from online. We just have so many coming in. This is from India, um, from Trupti Desai in Jodhpur, India. Uh, there are several questions. I'll, I'll just share two of them. Greetings from Jodhpur School of Public Health. What is the prevalence of eating disorders in South Asian countries? How do depression and anxiety affect eating disorders and vice versa? Anyone have an international perspective? Not from Southeast Asia, but um, South Asia? well, we yeah, certainly yeah. have seen more and more research yeah, from right. South Asia, from East Asia, and and yeah. really all over the world. I'm getting articles to review for journals, journal right, peer right. review from really all over the world. The p school of public health there, we need you, you to right. collect <laughs> those data. You need okay. to be telling it's us. We need to know how the prevalence uh, varies and varies across different subpopulations in the community. Um, there may be communities that are more disadvantaged economically or in terms of rights there, and we are very concerned about eating disorder symptoms in, in those settings too. So please publish the research, share your work with us. Thank you. I'd like to go to the studio audience. Uh, does anyone have a question? Yes, I think we have a microphone for you. This is a question for everyone in, um, on the panel. Does anyone have a sense of the epidemiological cost, um, say in America, in terms of uh, lives lost or dollars or qualities lost? Thank you. That work is, is um, underway, but behind several other nations. Um, Australia and the UK both have done national uh, economic studies of the cost of eating disorders in terms of 
qualities, as you mentioned, in terms of economic impact. And it's in the billions. Uh, translating the UK uh, uh, financial system or the Australian, it would be equivalent to billions of dollars. Um, in, in terms of the impact in the United States. Uh, our group with Striped has done some economic research, uh, and we have more undergoing now, uh, to, to look at these questions, and we've found um, a big, uh, partially getting there, we have found big disparities in terms of employment and annual income and impact on families because of uh, difficulties with working and maintaining a job, um, educational achievement, impairment and educational achievement. Uh, we expect as we get further into this research, it'll be similarly uh, uh, strong and uh, really devastating information about the impact of eating disorders in the United States, but that modeling still needs to be done here in this country. Yes, and fourth row. In terms of the regulation for uh, minimum BMI for models, um, that's not unprecedented when it comes to athletes, for example. Um, so if we look at uh, college athletes who are required to go do weigh-ins, and then that could lead to um, further eating disorders for people who are already vulnerable. So in terms of the legislation, I think it's a good idea, but how do you move that away from this well-intentioned idea that can cause other negative consequences to something that actually, um, yeah, that, that is something that actually works? Yeah, you raise a good question, and, and we're also very concerned about certain uh, sports, like competitive sports in colleges that use weight classes, because we know there's there's a uh, higher risk of eating disordered symptoms for weight control in some of these sports. Um, with models, actually, we've with Striped, we've moved away uh, from a, a hard limit on BMI. We've conducted recent research with my colleague Rachel Rogers at Northeastern University, actually talking to professional models about their perceptions of the different policy approaches. And there's a lot of concern about having a hard BMI limit to be employed. There's a, the, the worries uh, among models that it's gonna impact on them financially, that they won't be able to get jobs if there's a cutoff like that. And, and then we wouldn't want any regulations to actually make life harder for the people that it's meant to benefit. Now, uh, some of what the, the, French, the French law actually moved away from having a hard cutoff also, and they put more emphasis on the medical checkups and more the, the making sure the environment is a healthful environment. And that's what we wanna move toward in the United States also. Yes, in the second row. Hi, um, sorry my English, I don't speak English very well <laughs> because I'm from Brazil. I have been living here for one year and in Brazil um, I graduated in physical education and I have been uh, working with anorexic uh, clients because I was personal, <coughs> sorry, personal trainer. And um, I know that exercise is very important for health, mental health. And how can um, work exercise um, can be part of treatment? I think it's it's a difficult question, um, and we struggle with that in our program. We're trying with anorexia, often I'm trying to balance having somebody have an intake of calories and make weight gain progress, and also trying to add exercise onto that. Uh, uh, you know, there's some evidence to suggest that if people are gaining weight very you know, quickly it might not go in the places that they exactly want it to go, although it will over the next six months. But, you know, it, it, what does it make sense to bring some weight training into into that process? And, and we have things like walk group and um, other activities. But I think it's a difficult balance. And I think if you're on the road to recovery and health and improving and making progress, adding exercise into that can make a lot of sense. I think if you're really stuck in your eating disorder thinking and behaviors, and the exercise is part and parcel of that, then that's something uh, you might need to change. Uh, there's also this, this compulsive exercise that people get into. They don't exercise because they want to or it's fun or they feel good. It's because they feel they have to, um, almost like hand washing for obsessive compulsive disorder. And that's the kind of exercise we try to move away from. Uh, and sometimes when somebody's trying to get back into exercise, it makes sense to try a different activity rather than maybe going back to running where they're focused on times and splits and distance. And also I would add um, from, from an early intervention standpoint, fitness professionals and those who work um, in the fitness industry or um, with athletes or with others who are exercising, uh, 
you're really in a position to identify um, and you know even just you know when we talk about training and basic education you don't necessarily need to be an expert on eating disorders but even just some basic knowledge of signs and symptoms and things to look for um, can make a huge difference in identifying problematic behavior and directing someone to help at a point when that help can be most effective. Great. I, I know we're getting low on time. I'd just like to take a few more questions from online. This is from Debbie from our live chat. I'm recovering from anorexia and want more than anything to pay it forward by helping others who might be struggling and spreading the word on how frightening and serious these illnesses are. How can I help? Well, first of all, thank you for sharing your experience and um, certainly not alone. Um, I think one of the most important things uh, that we try to do at the National Eating Disorders Association is spread a message of hope. Um, when you're in it and when you're struggling, it can be very, very difficult to see, to see out of, of that obsession. Um, and so, you know, the, the, just the impulse to want to help and want to give back is a really, really positive step forward. Um, you know, sharing your story um, is, is, is really a first step. Um, and talking about the fact that it is possible to get help and reach out for help, um, I think makes a huge difference for others who might be in, in that darker place. And I would say also look up a uh, NIDA STAR program. Mm -hmm. Get involved in advocacy in your community. Uh, uh, the NIDA website has information about your advocacy program and that's a great way for people to, to give back or, or give forward. Great, thank you. Uh, this is from another viewer in India. Can eating disorders be genetic? I know we talked a little bit about that, but that yes. question has come up from a number of our viewers. Yes, we definitely know there's a genetic predisposition, so not everybody who's exposed to these images reacts to them. And I think there are a lot of us who want to understand who are the most vulnerable and can we help them. It's not strictly genetic, so that we know that you're not going to be, if you have a mother with an eating disorder, it does not mean that her children will all be eating disordered. They may be higher risk but there's definitely a strong genetic component. Great, great, thank you. Um, I know that we want to have time for the closing statements, so I think we'll end there, thank you. We're, we're coming to an end, but we have a few minutes left for an important uh, feature of this forum, which is that we'd like each panelist to give a policy recommendation, and their policy recommendations will be sent to policymakers and politicians to try to influence uh, policy on this, on eating disorders. Would you like to start? Sure, well, um, I'm gonna go back to um, my theme of early intervention. Um, I, I think it's critically important um, that we screen for eating disorders. So my policy recommendation is that we have eating disorder screenings in schools and that we move towards screenings um, in, in all areas possible. At what age? Um, from elementary school up, I would say. Um, and, and there are different uh, screening mechanisms and tools that are uh, validated. So. Um, I think that's really a critically important policy move. Thanks. Mine is very similar that in well child visits, the things that should be included, we ask about sunscreen, we ask about other things, but we need to ask about binging and purging behaviors and behaviors to become uh, more muscular regardless of how unhealthy they are. Yeah. I have two recommendations. I'll keep them quick. One federal, one for cities and states. We need the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to continue to add back in monitoring eating disorder symptoms. We've heard today how serious they are, how much they're under the radar. We need to do this monitoring and get that question back on the Youth Risk Behavior Survey that the CDC leads. My second recommendation is for cities and states. You have the regulatory authority to stop selling diet pills and dietary supplements for weight loss and muscle building to children. We can stop this. Cities and states can step in and ban the sale of these products to minors, can move them behind the counter and do any number of things. We wanna see their health departments and city councilors really step up to this challenge and protect our children. Oh. Sure. I, I think two things also. We need to close the loopholes with the mental health parity, uh, standardize the medical necessity criteria for the insurance companies around that. Uh, they need to cover all eating disorders uh, and remove the exemptions for the smaller companies and uh, also the private, some of the privately funded plans. And um, I, I think the, um, the uh, touch-up 
discussion made me also think, uh, you know, when I take a photo of a sunset and I post it on social media, I have to say hashtag no filter uh, or, <laughs> or people won't be impressed. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know if we can start a new trend, you know, on, on, these, on these photographs for advertising, maybe a hashtag no touch up uh, would be great. Thank you so much. Thank you to our panelists. Um, I want to encourage all of our viewers here in the studio and online to continue the conversation on the forum website, forumhsph.org, and to tune into the next forum, Zika in the U.S., Puerto Rico and Beyond, Risks and Response. And I want to thank uh, Les Leslie Cohn Bernstein and her family uh, for supporting these programs. And thank you for being here, and thank you all. Thank you.